Hi guys, and welcome to what we are calling Tinker's Tips. This is going to be a podcast and kind of YouTube series where we break down what we feel is some of the most important stuff about operating a novelty vending business. And there's a lot. There is a lot. So um, the reason we call this novelty vending is because we started by doing capsule machines, and then we moved on to crane machines, and of course a couple arcade machines, um, and we may pick up some more of those in the future. We'll see. Um, And so novelty, we kind of just feel like encompasses the entire industry in that sense. Toys, games, candy, that kind of thing. So we're going to have Tinker's Tips playing here on YouTube and over on Spotify as well. If you're listening to the podcast, make sure you follow for more episodes in the future. And if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe for more content. But yeah, before we get into it, let's talk a little bit about the business. You want to talk about what we do when we started? So we started in August of 2022 under a completely different name than we are now. We were not anything about Tinker's Toy and Hobby. We did not get that branding set up yet, but we're really happy that we did. It really all started with one single rack that had stickers, gum, and candy, and toys. And just it wasn't even that nice at the time. There was no good labels, but it was a great start for us. And it was the thing that kind of ignited us wanting to go for it and get intense with it. Then the other thing we got was a three head sticker machine. And between those two machines, that's how we ever got everything started from this point on. And so since then, we've grown into claw machines. We seem to be continuing to grow in that direction. And of course, we've touched base on YouTube, started sharing our journey with other people on the internet. Um, and we've started working with a supplier and distributor to put out some blog posts and coincidentally labeled Tinker's Tips to start teaching other people how to do this for themselves. And we're getting into um, understanding how many more distributors there are overseas and in the U.S., and we will talk about that more later in this podcast. So in this episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about what we consider to be the biggest things that you need to consider when starting your own vending business, um, especially when it comes to the novelty side of things. So these are going to be things that have helped us um, and things that we're hoping will help somebody else out there. And the very first thing that we're going to jump into is the importance of learning the trade. Not everybody gets into this and just knows what they're doing right off the bat. No, not at all. We weren't even close to anything like that. No, it took us a really long time. Looking back at pictures of our first machines, it's just honestly a little embarrassing seeing how much we still had to learn at the time. So we've come a long way and we want to help you guys do that same exact thing. But you're never expected to know anything when you get started, not even just with vending. When you first start something, you have to start somewhere and it's almost never where you would want to see yourself, but you were always encouraged to learn more. And just the journey of actually going through with it is just, it's so rewarding over time. So the first thing you're going to want to do when it comes to learning the trade is take a look at how this industry has grown in your area. Is it an area where there's not a lot of people doing it? There's not a lot of small vendors. For us, we only have one other small vendor in our area, but then we have a bunch of big contracted companies that come out and manage um, different businesses in our area. So we have some big competition, but there's not a lot of little guys out here like us that are going out to small local businesses. So we do have a little bit of a foot in the door there. Taking the whole picture in. (laughs) Yeah, taking the whole picture in as it applies to your area. How does this industry work in your area and what does your competition look like? And try to use people for motivation um, and to learn from. So when you're trying to get into vending or anything, figure out who's done it well and what they did and learn from them because they've been around doing the thing that you're trying to do for a lot longer and can help you get over some hurdles that you're going to probably inevitably hit if you don't learn about them sooner. In our arsenal, we have people like Quick Play and Top Lift Top line thrift find. That one's always hard for me to say. Extreme vending, investment, joy, and the list goes on. Howard Hospitality, Galaxy yep. Game. We wouldn't have been into vending at any point. We wouldn't have realized that miniature right. claw machines existed if we weren't watching other people um, and how their success built up over time a lot more quickly than you would think. Um, I think Extreme Vending is up to 100 locations now, and he's only been doing this since 2018, if I, I remember correctly. So it really does grow. Vending is what I consider a self fulfilling prophecy because once you start, if you're willing to put that work in, you will. We'll see it become successful. And all of these people are so great for the community because they all have something different that they can share. And taking all of that information in is giving us such a wide overview of what we want to try to accomplish. And it's just great to have these different opinions that we can work off of. And they've all done it just amazing. There's no single answer to get to where you're at. All of them have done so wonderful with their own ways about going about it. So it's just, it's it's great to have people you can look up to. Yeah. And the one thing too, to take into consideration is you really need to be willing to learn. You can't go into this thinking that you got it all right from the beginning or you'll, you'll remain stagnant. We would have still been in that position we were when we very first started out where none of our machines had labels and we really just thought we knew what we were doing and we never would have grown. We would have thought that was as good as it gets for us. But you have to be willing to learn from other people. Failure is an opportunity to learn. We never look at failure as as actual failure. We look at it as a chance to do better the next time. So so don't get discouraged when things don't work out for you right away and um, just be willing to do better the next time. Yes, absolutely. Failure is such a good 
learning <laughs> method. It's a great tool. So your ability to communicate well is a massive factor in your long-term success. And so that's another thing that we're going to be t covering here. Um, yeah, communication is really such a foundational um, building block to doing anything business related or having better relationships with people. Especially in a business like this, that's very pitch heavy. A lot of your success in the vending industry relies on your ability to go out and have those conversations with people. So that's really huge in this industry. And you don't know who you're going to talk to yet. So when you go out to these new locations and you speak to managers or owners and you are trying to pitch the same thing to all these different people, you are speaking to different people who have different opinions, different lives, different understandings about how certain things work. So it's really important to learn about mirroring and understanding how your feelings and your gestures and how you come across is, you know, able to kind of match them. And another thing too, that's really important is knowing when to say something and when not to say something. I think back when we very first started, we were very word vomit when we went into pitch to places and Michael does most of our pitching now, but he's really, really improved over time. And he's actually gotten us one of our best locations this year. When, when you spend your time rambling to a business owner, you kind of take away from the the opportunity to hear their concerns and be able to mitigate those concerns going forward. They may think that these machines are going to take a lot of electricity. And if you are talking through the entire time you're there with them, you lose the opportunity to tell them when they bring that concern to your attention that they really only take a couple bucks a month to run. And that's the thing I'm still trying to get better about is rambling. Because, you know, as you can see in these videos, I still ramble and I'm not improving at the rate that maybe I'm comfortable with. But what I've learned over getting all of these no's or quote unquote failures, more often than not, they're going to say no for these reasons, or they're going to say yes for these three reasons. So cover those quickly, you know, be respectful of their time. You don't want to waste more of it. And over time, you're going to realize a lot of the stuff you had to say wasn't really necessary to begin with. And you can cut yourself. If you get a no, you at least are not wasting as much of your time trying to do it by figuring out what every single one of those people said no over in the past. So one thing we hear a lot, and not just with vending, but with a lot of different business ventures that people around us have been interested in starting is that there is a lot of oversaturation. And that's one thing that we don't 100% believe in. Every business idea, every idea in general out there is a recycled version of something somebody has already done before. It's a matter of how much effort you are willing to put into making yours one step for it. Vending is very unique in the sense that it um, is something that can apply to multiple different places. There's constantly new businesses opening. There's constantly businesses that don't have any machines. And really, I mean, it's just a matter of getting into those places that somebody else hasn't already. I think about when um, I hear the word oversaturation, even though me and Callie don't specifically do this, I think about e-commerce. And the reason why is you hear all the time about how a lot of people, they sell stuff on Amazon FBA or on eBay or on Shopify on their own websites, and they're making hundreds of thousands a year, if not more. And think about all the listings on all those different sites for the same exact product. There is no better word or example for oversaturation. That doesn't mean it can't be done, but you have your part to play and something that everyone's going to try to play. No idea is unique. I'm sorry if you think your brand new idea is unique, <laughs> but it is the same idea that has been recycled and improved on. And in 10 years from now, everything we're talking about today is going to be an outdated idea of what vending is. We have to just continue to learn. And a lot of the time learning is going to be because you get overstepped on, you have a failure or what you consider a misfortune. So just don't look at it that way. And some too of vending is um, one upping yourself even to a degree. Um, when we first started, like I said, none of us or none of our stuff had labels. And that was the very first thing we fixed was getting labels on everything. And then we started switching out product and then we got into new machines. And so you're constantly trying to one up, not just what other people are doing, but what you're doing, trying to improve where you specifically stand. Exactly. And so we have a little bit of a chicken or egg situation going on here when it comes to whether or not you should have your machine or your location first. Um, and this can kind of go either way. There's people that are very strongly against getting machines before you have a location. We have done it both ways. People have their own opinions about it. So that is the thing I feel like has been the most controversial in our opinions when we've talked about this. A lot of people think you should have a machine first because it is more inclining for a business owner to see it and envision it in their shop and say yes so the, there's a higher likelihood of success but you're also taking a higher risk because you're buying something before you know for sure if it's going to make you money back um it can absolutely go either way i think what it comes down to is everyone's situation is different and your finances are different so just don't get what you can't afford if you can afford to get a machine first 
Um, go ahead and do it if it's not putting you in a hole. But if you're just getting into this and this is going to be a large step and this is honestly a huge risk for you financially, time wise, um, you know, go seek out locations first, build on all the other important aspects of vending, like your communication skills that I that is arguably the most important thing is your communication skills. And one way you can tackle this too is if you have the money up front and a lot of people don't, which is why they get into vending. It's a little bit more accessible. But if you do have a chunk of change to put in up front, look for a route that's already been started yeah. and purchase that route. That kind of saves you having to handle that question whether or not you need to have the machine or location because things are already set up for you. On the same token though, routes will almost always be more expensive. People are going to be charging a premium because they did the hardest part about getting the location first. You're going to be putting up more up front to overcome the communication problem of getting the location. But in this kind of industry, you're going to need to learn that anyways. And there's also a lot of risks involved with buying a route. Like why are they selling it for something that seems so plug and play and turnkey? If they are selling it, it might not be making a lot of money. There may be a problem with the restaurant closing down. There may be an actual relationship issue and you don't know what that is. But in this business, you're going to have to learn to have your communication skills improve. So if getting the location is the hardest part for you and that's what's making you consider a, a route i'm sorry to say boohoo because that's literally just how it has to happen and that is the hardest part putting thousands of dollars in isn't easy but it's arguably twice as easy as actually finding those locations but you can do it at the end of the day only put in what you can afford if that means buying one gumball machine and starting with that a used gumball machine at that um, start there and work your way up um, there, there's always room to grow in this industry and that's one of the things that makes it the most accessible candy machines go for usually brand new about 150 dollars, and i can see at some of our better locations like mexican restaurants and pizza places those can make 40 50 bucks quick play generally makes 90 to 110 dollars a month per a candy machine. And if you, I mean, think about that, that's one month and you paid off the machine. Again, that comes down to finding the right locations, but you just have to do that. So so let's talk a little bit about the costs of starting out because that's a question that we get a lot over on YouTube. Um, and again, only put in what you can afford. It can really, really vary depending on the type of uh, machines you want to get into. If you're just looking to run gumball machines, you're probably not going to see very high startup costs. If you want to run claw machines, obviously you're getting into more expensive territory there. Um, you can buy used. We haven't really had super good experiences with that. We didn't really know what to look for in the beginning. And so for beginners, we don't really recommend buying used until you've had it experience with machines working on them yourself so that you know what to look for in a machine um but that being said you can find good deals keep your eyes peeled every once in a while you'll see something pop up on facebook marketplace that's worth your time um and you can start as small as honor boxes even if gumball machines are too expensive for you try some honor boxes i think the the ratio should be and this isn't you know set in stone but this is my opinion I think if you have anywhere from zero to a hundred dollars to start, which is practically nothing, start with some honor boxes. You can get those for twenty, thirty dollars a piece plus the lollipops, or you can put in your own candy, customize them however you want. They are much easier to convince a location, especially because they go for um, charity. They help charities out and they only sit on a counter. So there's no risk at all as far as business owners are concerned. I don't think I actually have ever gotten one no from an honor box whenever I went out to try to get locations. So if you have zero to hundred, I would go with that. If you have anywhere from a hundred to 500, we would suggest, I think, either candy, bulk, toy, and gum racks, just something that's kind of a bulk machine. And if you're going to go with candy, I'd really suggest gum just because the yeah. profit margins on there are a lot Candy better. is going way down in terms of how much money you make it costs. I think I was reading for peanut M&Ms about nine cents for four M&Ms now, which is yeah. absolutely terrible. Yeah. Um, I think if you have anywhere from 500 to 1,000, you should try to get your first claw machine and go get it placed somewhere, maybe without a credit card reader. And if you have anywhere from two to 5,000, you should shoot for a route before you do anything, but you should definitely use due diligence. Another thing that's really important to us, something that we try to do as we grow as opposed to later in the, the game, and that's part of the reason we've grown so slowly, is optimizing the locations you have before you do a lot of big growth. If you get 50 locations all at once and they're all like haphazardly maintenance, you're not really getting out there as often as you can, and the products you're stocking aren't working for those locations, you're not going to see the best you can out of those locations. Right. So I think that um, optimizing the locations you have, growing a little bit at a time is really important. Um, claw machines, it's a little easier because 
because you can kind of stock them with the same stuff across the board barring you're not like in a weird situation but i do think that it's also important to make sure you have the time and the energy to get out and maintenance all of those locations for us it's slowly become a multi <laughs> we're slowly spending more time on our route than we used to which is fine we really enjoy it but it is something that probably would have overwhelmed us a lot if we had had all of this all at once right in the beginning and if you don't focus on your quality and you try to grow before your quality is really as good as it can be per location if you're growing that's assuming you're going to keep doing vending in the long term if you're going to keep doing vending in the long term you want to focus on quality because that's the image that you are representing yourself for so don't grow before you're willing to give yourself a good image because that's going to help you get more locations in the future anyway. You want to make yourself stand out in the competition, especially if this is considered oversaturated. And you really want to give those locations that you currently service the best vouch they can give you. If they're really, really nice people, we have a few really nice people on our route that have been willing to give us numbers to other business owners and stuff like that. They're not going to do that for you. They're not going to take that extra step for you if you haven't shown them that you're even capable of managing the machine right. you've provided for them. So you really want to you know, keep those good relationships with the businesses that you're working with, show them you're going above and beyond. And that can really go really long for you, really far for you in the long run. Right. Because think about it. You wouldn't be able to get a job without a resume. Every location that you make happy is you building your business resume. They might be able to reference you for the future. And without that resume, you will have a lot harder of a time getting your first job or your next job, you know, so to speak. You're building your resume every time you have yourself a happy client. So, And one thing that we're asked a lot is, do you need a license or an LLC to operate your business? This is something that really strongly varies from place to place. We're based in Oregon, and so they have a lot more lax regulations on their claw machines and entertainment industry. Um, that being said, an LLC is something we do recommend regardless of your state because it protects your personal assets. If your machine falls on a kid and the parents decide to sue you and you do not have an LLC in place, you're going to have an issue with them coming after your personal assets if your business is not able to pay them um, fee, that settlement. Right. Um, so LLCs are... Um, they do make your taxes a little bit more complicated, at least from what we're finding. We're actually going to a tax professional this year. Maybe that's not the case for everybody, but for us, we were a little confused with it. But it is really important to future-proof and protect yourself and your own personal assets if something goes wrong. It's in the name LLC, Limited Liability Company. It's literally protecting you from having a future issue that no one expects to have happen. You get car insurance so that if you have a car crash, heaven forbid, you're covered. It is the same way with running a business. We had one kid who was about two, three years old who who thought on this little toy machine, you got the prizes from the top. So he climbed on the top trying to get it, but the machine fell on him. Thank God it was really light and it didn't hurt anyone. And the mother, she knew that she wasn't watching him and stuff. But that is a prime example if it were to get worse than that. If that mom couldn't have covered that, that bill, if he had gotten hurt, they will immediately go to what the cause was, which was us. And you're not at all of these locations. And the more you grow, the higher your risk is going to be. So you want to make sure you're covered because the last thing you want is for one mistake to happen two years in the business, right when you think it's really kicking off and have your whole business repoed plus things from your personal life. And you could destroy everything. And the scary thing, but it is really cheap and easy to set it up the right way right in the beginning. Um, so we're going to cover this a little bit later in the episode, but obviously you're going to want to purchase a machine and stock, and there's lots of different places you can do this. We'll cover this later in the episode. We're going to get into some FAQs here in a little bit, and that'll be one of the ones we cover. Um, but really, next, you kind of get into the point of, okay, you got your business started, you have machines out on locations, you're starting to make money, and now you kind of have to decide what are you going to be doing with that money. And really, that comes down to your long-term priorities. We've had family and we've had friends and we just had a couple of people in the past mention or ask us well you're making this money now why don't you just go out and get yourself a different car why don't you go out and buy yourself a new computer if you're wanting one you know anything that has come up that we are trying to save up for or just get in a position to have the first question is is you have vending as an income so why don't you use that in my personal opinion and this may vary for people the second you start spending your income, that's your business income, whether it's on bills or frivolous expenses or a new car, you stop your growth. So you can continue to take that money, reinvest it and keep scaling the money you make. The second you decide to stop or start spending it, you, you stop your scaling. So don't start, in my opinion, don't start spending your money 
until you are happy with what you make and you don't want to make anything else after that. Because once you spend it all, you have no more scalability and that's where it stops. And obviously it can depend a lot on how much you're making from your business. If you're making $10,000 a month and you want to spend a thousand on a laptop, obviously that's probably not going to stop your scaling. But when you're very first starting out, we really can do nothing more than recommend continuing to reinvest that into your business because that's going to have such a huge huge impact on your long-term sustainability. You're building your retirement doing it that way, in my opinion. All right. So one of the things we're going to get into in this episode is some FAQs from over on our YouTube channel. We've had a lot of very commonly asked questions. So we're going to go ahead and get, go through those with you guys. Um, and hopefully that'll answer any questions that you guys might already be having. Having, If not, you can always go comment on the channel or send us an email using the show note description thing. We'll figure out how to set that up later. But uh, yeah, let's get into some FAQs. So um, what item do you think we sell the most of? Single item? What single item do you think is like the most sought after out of all of our machines? I don't know if this is biased because I prefer these. I feel like every time we go service a machine, like a claw machine, anytime it's like still full, like it hasn't been played that much, I swear the Pokemon packs are still always gone. So we have a lot of Pokemon packs in our claw machines and those seem to go really quickly. Um, I would say maybe second to that is our actual Pokeball capsule because those seem to be what always runs out before we have more. Even during the winter or in candy and ice cream stores, it seems like Blow Pop gum is still interesting enough that people still go for them. So in the candy regards, it's definitely Blow Pop gum. And we have Dippin' Dots gum now. We're probably going to make a review about that later on in the channel. Yeah. Um, gum is obviously a favorite, and if it's candy filled, I mean, yeah, we really enjoy that. As far as candy goes, gum is definitely a bestseller. Yeah. So, how many lo- minis do we have on location? Mini claw machines? Um, on on location, we have um, Dairy Queen, Dairy Queen. We have um, Fudge Shop. We have Mexican Cantina, and then I think we have um, the Magic Cut's not a mini, and then we have one. So that's four, isn't it? Four. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, he said we have the Magic Cut. Right. Um, so yeah, we have five electronic machines on location. The Magic Cut's not really a mini claw machine, but we kind of just group it in there because it's the same kind of genre. And, we and it makes it. pretty close to the same margin, yeah. same recost. And then we have one that we have on hand that we're trying to decide whether or not we're going to sell or if we're actually going to go place it. I feel like it's in our best interest to place it. I said or... recost. I meant restock cost. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're, so we're trying to figure out what to do with that fifth mini, but right now we have four minis and one Magic Cut on location. Um, what type of machines do we have? Um, I think we pretty much covered that in this episode. Um, we have some capsule machines, sticker machines, candy machines. We, we dabble in a little bit of everything as long as it's novelty related. We're dabblers. Um, how did you approach Dairy Queen? I want to do this in my hometown. So we get this question a lot. Mm. Luck. <laughs> I was going through all the questions we've been asked on our channel and probably 10 times this has come up in the last few months. Um, so I literally was just being in the right place at the right time. We, When we very first started, both worked at a little Dairy Queen franchise. We talked to the owner every time he came in and you know just kind of formed a good relationship with him and right around the same time we started our business we started thinking about the fact that you know we have this machine it's placed at a little barber shop it's not doing really well that's a whole story on its own um and so we decided we'd ask him if we could place it there it ended up working out great he owns two franchises so we were able to get into both of them we didn't involve corporate we didn't do anything past that it just happened to be a franchise owner aesthetically it looks really nice too i mean for being our big red machine it looks like, it looks invisible. Like, it doesn't stand out. It doesn't look like no one besides the owner put it there just because it happened to fit so well. So, yeah, I mean, it was literally just a right time, right yeah. place kind of situation. I don't um, think we could ever do it again. They, they, I think it also comes down to the inspector that comes through. They have a very good relationship with their inspector. And obviously, we keep things cleaned and stocked. So we haven't really risen any red flags. And that may change in the future. But as it stands right now, there doesn't seem to be any issues. Not to say there won't be later, though. Short answer. I think the stars just kind of aligned a little little bit. I don't think this is something that's going to just be common. If you show up there, they don't know who you are. I think your odds are really small. I'm not saying they're impossible. I, I've seen people who are in Applebee's and people that are in like Texas Roadhouse. So oh, yeah, it's definitely possible to get into franchises. Yeah. For us, it was just a lucky situation and yeah. we aren't in any other franchises currently. Um, we do have a Burger King we were talking to for a while, but I think we've kind of decided we're not going to keep pushing that one because even though the manager seems interested, it seems really unlikely that a franchise will say yes. And our, our efforts are better spent elsewhere right now. Yeah. Oh, I said we'd get into this later. So where do we buy our machines? 
where do we buy our inventory? Um, so there's a few places that we started with. Candy Machines was obviously our first like real website that we started ordering from back in the beginning. We didn't even know if they were legit at the time, but things happened to work out. Um, that's where we got a lot of our candy and toys for our capsule machines. And then we moved on to their super minis. And eventually we started ordering mega minis from Rainy over on Alibaba. And around the same time that we did that, we started ordering inventory from Eva on Alibaba. Um, all of this stuff will be linked down below. Um, we've recently started working with a distributor in the U.S. who provides the same prizes that Eva provides, um, but acts as a middleman to take away some of the shipping risk that comes with it. Um, so his website is toyboxhq.net, and um, he seems to be growing pretty quickly. So if you're looking for a low-risk way to get those prizes, that's a really great option. I think if you're entry level and you're just getting into vending, whether it's racks or claw machines, I kind of advocate for candy machines because mm -hmm. when they brought our machine to us, after going through Rainy, the machine was assembled, but you still had to put in the prize door, the NAX reader, install the antenna, a lot of those things. If you're looking for something plug and play, candy machines is definitely They do is so good. Their cable routing is great, where they put their antenna is accessible. All of the things are screwed in and correct. They usually provide you with starting price to put in there. So if you want something that'll show up at your door already has prizes you just have to empty a bag toss it in plug it in candy machines will have it ready for you and their customer support's really good even the owner will get right on a call with you more often than not and help you with troubleshooting and i don't think i've ever seen customer service like that so once you're a little bit more experienced and you're ready to take that risk and you're financially capable of taking the risk i do think the most cost effective people to order from are rainy, rainy. and eva yeah. um they have a fantastic reputation you can read more about them in the extreme vending discord and of course there's lots of people that have put out youtube videos about how to order from them, what it looks like when you order from them. So there are resources out there, but I won't say it's the most beginner-friendly option. If you're looking for a way to get your hands on some of those prizes EBA offers without the risk as a beginner, I think um, Toybox HQ is a really good middleman to go through, and Red Claw Vending has also grown a lot recently. What percentage do we typically pay for commission, and where do we hide our prize locker keys? We started at 10% in the beginning. Actually, most of our locations, almost all of them, did not want anything. They didn't ask for anything. And so we did 10 optionally to, and we did it to the employee tip jars. That's what we did to stand out in the area as we thought by going through the employee tip jars rather than the owners, the money would seem bigger and stretch further. The employees would be happier. Um, otherwise, we have switched over to 20% for the same exact reasons. The money goes to the same place, but we feel 20% is fair. We still make enough money and what they make is still noticeable. And I think it makes a lot more people happy that way. 20% to an owner who already owns owns a fantastic business that's thriving really is going to feel like pocket change. But to an employee, somebody who's coming in and dropping $40 in the tip chart once, that is great for them because usually it involves no work on their part. Um, it also inclines them to keep an eye out for our machines and give us an inside scoop as to what kind of prizes people are trying to win. Um, so we found that it really helps us build a good working relationship with the employees at our establishments and that has served us very well so far. Um, and it's something we plan to continue doing. A lot of owners too are a little bit um, surprised by the commission tip jar thing because it's a little bit different than what's been offered typically in the vending community. And that's how we try to stand out. But also in the same token, when you give that money to the employees, not only are they happier and like she said, they watch out for your machine more, they're more likely to play it too. And that's not our reason for doing that. But we've noticed that that is a lot more common when we started doing higher tip percentages. I started noticing more plays and higher feedback from those employees too, which was kind of interesting. Because, I mean, they know they're getting something out of it. So, of course, they're going to be kind of encouraging other people to play. They're going to be playing more themselves because they know that they're going to get a cut. And um, that has really worked out for us. Uh, where do we hide our prize locker keys? So, this kind of varies. Um, before we got the machines from Rainy, um, those prize locker keys from Rainy are a little bit too big to fit in the Pokeballs. But originally, we were hiding them in a white Pokeball in the same spot in all of our machines. We still hide them in that spot, but we just put them in a normal capsule now um, so people yeah. can see that there's a key inside. It seems to have worked out just fine, um, but we don't don't really do anything special with our keys otherwise yeah the pokeballs each of them have you know like red and white or blue and white and purple and white and we would just take the colored portions and stick them together so there'd be like a blue and purple with two figures inside so we would just mix the figures and then we would take the white parts of the pokeball put them together and we'd put the key in but like she was saying the um the key is now bigger than the capsule can be for the pokeballs so we just use some of our two inch capsules and empty them out because that's all that we have on hand we're trying to think of some new creative ways to go about it and to put some keys in to more interesting in spots. We just haven't gotten there yet, but so far it's been working fine and we have pretty regular winners. And so how many claw machines do we plan to build the business up to? This year or in general? In general. I would say a minimum of 50. 
that's kind of our plan. Um, we're hoping we can hit that in the next two years. Um, it'd be great if we could hit it by the end of 2025. But... We did an interview with Nathan Johnson, and he kind of asked us where our ventures were going to be going and how we started with vending. We had a really similar um, mindset where vending is going to be an awesome, I think it's always going to be a sweet spot for us, and we're always going to take it very seriously. Um, we have plenty of other things that we plan to do in the next five, 10 years. This is just the beginning of doing something for ourselves in the long run, building our retirement and you know having a happy life. Life while we do it. I think long term, we're looking to hopefully get into real estate after we retire someday. And um, in the meantime, maybe like laundry mats or some kind of self serve arcade setup like Quick Play has going on. So, I mean, most of it is we're trying to buy our time back and we're probably not going to be growing past the point that we feel like we've bought our time. So if we get to 50 machines, we feel like, okay, this is all we can handle. That's probably where we're going to stop. And then we're going to start looking into some other ventures. So we've been trying to read more books recently. I know this is a little off topic. We're reading more books to try to like get some self-improvement going and try to get some new fundamental ideas that we want to practice. And right now I'm reading Atomic Habits. This is my second time trying to go through the book. It bored me the first time, but I, I know it's an important book. Um, one thing that they talk about is your 1% improvement each day makes a massive change. And one thing I noticed is we, in the beginning, had the same idea. We want this vending business to buy our time back. And even though we're not done and we want to keep going and we have ideas for where we want to be. We have watched our hours. We work a day job go from like 40 all the way down to 20 and double the income that we're doing. And we're able to work much less, be happier. We have multiple different things that we do on the side. Vending is just one of like four, but it's so fun to have a different job every day, spend less time doing it all collectively and still feel like we have a better quality of living and we can cover things a little better because, you know, people in our generation are, you know, they're struggling to figure out what they want to do. They are making lots of money and spending their time or they're making nothing and spending their time. And I just, I have to say, I mean, like, it's just like he was saying with the 1% improvements every single day. That, that I think, was one of the books that kind of turned around our mindset on the, okay, we don't have to make a massive change overnight. We can actually, like, work on this a little bit at a time and see it do something good in the long run. We've been at this business almost two years now, and we can absolutely say that that has been the case. Our life now, even though we're not exactly where we want to be, is on such a good trajectory compared to where it was two years ago. Um, and there is a lot of just pride that comes out of operating your own business and being able to work on it a little bit at a time. And it doesn't just have to be working on your route. And that's one of the reasons we started making content was so we could feel like we were working on the business when there wasn't anything to do for the route side. And also so we can teach other people how to make that change for themselves. It's great to set goals. And then once you set goals and you think about where you want to see yourself, break those goals down into steps. Think about, well, what would a person in those positions do? You know, if I want to make 100000 a year, what would some making $100,000 a year be doing in my head, figure out what kind of character that is, and then break those steps down to become that person to mirror that behavior. And I think that has been a really great way for us to improve because what we have wanted to see ourselves accomplish in a five year mark, we can usually knock out in a year or two just by writing and writing it all down and taking really small steps to get there. We accomplish things five times faster than we expect to just by having it on paper, honestly. And I think one thing that's really changed about us over the last two years is our, our mindset and how much we appreciate the people around us that can act, that we can learn from. I think two years ago, we thought we had it figured out and we did not have it figured out at all. And um, since then, I mean, we've gotten closer to my grandmother and her husband who were both business owners in various different avenues in their life. And we've been able to learn so much from them over the last even just six months, I think the things they've taught us have been incredibly useful. And um, so we really appreciate having those people in our life. And But we didn't like realize how much we could learn from them until we started doing something for ourselves. So before we get off of the topic of books and move on to our next question, um, other than Atomic Habits, and Dave Ramsey's Baby Steps Millionaires and Total, Total Money, money makeover, makeover will absolutely change your perspective on money and how you manage your money. Where do you get your honor boxes from? Um, VendingSolutions.com. Yeah, VendingSolutions.com, um, and that is run by Dominic Barbado. If you haven't checked out his channel, he also makes vending content, um, and he just happens to manage that site as well. So go check is it out. Is there any other um, places to sell honor boxes, or is he kind of the... I know he's, he's like the main, the main one. one right now. Um, I haven't really looked into any others. That was kind of the first thing that showed up when I was looking for honor boxes back in the day. So um, do you place most of your machines at local places or national branded businesses? We've kind of already touched on this a little bit. Those two Dairy Queen franchises are, are only branded businesses. So that being said, um, 
Yeah, no. Most of our stuff is just small mom and pop shops, and that has served us really well. Actually, the better. small mom and pop shops do better for us yep. than Dairy Queen does. So yeah, don't don't let the franchise idea confuse you. We've had some collections where we've making making where we have made so very little. It's... People expect franchises to be a gold mine, and we can just say from experience, even though we're into pretty busy franchise locations, they are not the gold mines you would expect. Actually, realistically speaking, Mexican restaurants seem to be doing much better. Pizza um, places. Chinese food shops, really. Um, entertainment venues. Yeah, basically. Um, well, I guess one way we have to look at it is, especially in a busy town where there's like 20 different types of foods you can eat, um, most people are going to go to a more interesting restaurant than burgers. So we kind of already touched on this, but we're going to specify this. Um, so this person asked where they can get a good mix to put in their claw machine. That isn't from Alibaba because they don't or trust ordering from there. If you are, guys are, I don't know of anybody that does mixes really other than candy machines. And I'm not really a big fan of their mixes for their claw machines. Sorry. Um, sorry, guys. We do like your website, but I don't like your claw mixes. I wish you would reinspect that and put some better stuff out there um but toy box hq and red claw vending both yeah. provide um individual prizes i don't think they do mixes yet but i think that's something they might may consider doing in the future um, we so also talked about maybe setting that up on our website because we started buying stuff in such big order quantities from alibaba and we always go through each individual product which i think we um we make it a video we're making a video about right now opening up everything actually that's already out we um, make our own mixes with a bunch of different prizes so right so one of the things we were going to start doing on our own website tinkers toy and is setting up electronic mixes plushie mixes keychain mixes which right now we're trying to get into the process of doing it's been a slow start but it's getting in the mix or it's getting start it's getting in the mix um so eventually we're hoping we can start Start sending out some mixes of like specific things so you can buy an electronic mix that'll have the tamagotchi little pets and um what are some watches, of the, the watches and so basically yeah, that's something we're looking into it's not quite set up yet but if that's something you're interested in pre-made claw mixes that you can get here in the u.s um that have some of those more sought after prizes that eva provides without having to go through any of the <laughs> without having to go through any of the risk yourself comment below <laughs> comment below do we use nyx readers on our machines actually we got three machines from rainy recently we thought we weren't going to order them and then we realized not even that we were too concerned about getting credit card sales but we just wanted to be able to see what the machines were doing from a distance it can be a great way to make sure your locations aren't unplugging your machines so um yeah definitely one of the biggest reasons because that one small period of time we were thinking about just getting a bunch of machines from rainy and not getting card uh, readers on them because we were making 90 percent of our income at least in just cash one thing that we decided like she said is we want to be able to monitor them from home hence the reason we got them once we added a better eva mix I swear it, it's like 50, 60% credit card sales. Our credit card sales spiked when we put better stuff in because people are more willing to pay with a credit card if they have one than cash. And the people that were paying for cash probably were like kids or grandparents giving their kids stuff. But now that we have a better mix, the people who have cards are more likely to use it. So put a better mix in. I think your card sales will start improving. Another reason you should let us know if you're interested in mixes so we can get that started. <laughs> um, uh, we have a couple questions about forming LLCs. If we talk to a business lawyer to do that, we formed our LLC ourselves. It's really easy to do. I think we paid $100 and then Gator Claw Games paid an account to put his LLC together. Um, I think it was about $400 for him. You can really go either way. We've also worked with Taylor Brands and they'll put your LLC together for you. So there's a few different options out there. Um, but I think it's easy enough that if you're confident doing it yourself, you can do it yourself. It comes down to personal preference really on that one. It might be that I have silly brain, but if you are going to get an LLC and you and a partner are doing it together, so you both have ownership in it, um, I would just get a bookkeeper at least for the first year, ask them questions, figure out how to do it. We've used TurboTax and H&R Block every single year when we've done our taxes. But as you start making more money, you have more property, you have more assets. It just feels like you don't, yeah, you don't want to hurt yourself in the long run. Just pay the money, make sure it's done right. They take the brunt of it, something goes wrong. And you have a little bit of leeway while you're getting arranged in those first three years, but you want yeah. to make sure you're getting off to like the best start you can so right. that in the future you are ready to go. Um, so last question, do you recommend getting a stacker for bills? I prefer stackers. I feel like they are less conspicuous than giant piles of money. And to me, it makes me feel safer. Um, that being said, we do have a few machines out now that don't have stackers and it's not really that big of a deal as I thought it was going to be. Who was it that gave you the stacker idea? Oh, so I don't remember Brilliant. who it was. Don't remember who it was. I think it was an FEC operator person over on the Facebook page. Um, but they said that they have an extra stacker that they just bring in with them and they carry the entire stacker out and just put the new stacker in. 
um, so that nobody ever sees any money. And I Pop thought the that money was... out, put it in. It doesn't doesn't even look like you're pulling money out. You're just switching a part out. I really thought that was brilliant, and that is something we may consider in the future. Um, we just have to get stackers added to the rest of our machines. Yeah. Before so we just got some machines from Rainy, some Mega Minis, and we were really surprised. We opened up the door to do a collection, and we were expecting to see the stackers that we've been used to, and we saw the pile of cash at the bottom. It just was like, oh... It made it seem like it was a lot more money than it was, and it just kind of threw us off. But yeah, we really prefer stackers. And we actually ran an ad with Taylor Brands, and in that ad, when we pull out the stacker and we pull the money out, which was 100% legit, we didn't stage it at all, people were commenting, those bills are too crisp and clean to be real, and this isn't real. And that's one of the benefits of the stacker. It was 100% real. We just get to have our money ironed out when it goes in there. Because it sits in a stacker throughout the rest of the month, and it's kind of like pressed with the spring, it keeps everything nice and straight, which makes it easier to account later i Presses really prefer it. them but they, yeah they it's not necessary sense. they make um, sense and for pulling about cash i don't know it, how this... it's a personal preference thing we prefer yeah. stackers then you, we'll leave i it. could <laughs> get into that for a while but yeah <laughs> longer than we need to we're coming up on an hour really? um yeah oh, really. we did good all right so that is about all we have for frequently asked questions and just our general overview of what's most important when it comes to actually starting your vending business so to start summarizing everything that we talked about just to make it really quick and stomachable um learn the trade and that means learn how to communicate learn what you're doing, the best way to go about it for your situation, because it's going to be different. Take inspiration from people that have done it before you and what they did and what helped and what hurt and figure out new ways to improve and to optimize what you're already doing. You know, oversaturation, uh, that is a fancy word for it's not worth my time and everything is worth your time because you can always put in something better than your neighbor's. Um, it was like I was telling Callie earlier, if you have a neighborhood of dirty cars and you wash your cars, yours will shine brighter. You drive to a shinier neighborhood and you wax your car. You can always get do something a little better. <laughs> do something better than your neighbors. It doesn't have to be better than how vendors are in Florida. If you're in Oregon, it doesn't have to be better than how it is in Texas. If you're in North Carolina, just do better than your neighbors, as bad as that sounds, and slowly improve what your competition is doing as you expand. And then really, if you're in this for the long term, term just make sure that you are reinvesting that money yeah. and not spending it and getting used to spending it all at once. That's really um, one of the big, biggest things that helped us grow was reinvesting that money. Um, and that's going to continue to be our plan going forward, probably for at least the next two years. And, you know, we'll see where we're at then. But I think they say with like when you invest in stocks, even when it goes down, you lose nothing until you sell. And I think that's a good way to look at it. Like, if you have your money, even if you make less or if you make more, if there's damage or something, put the money in that you can to scale it. You know, don't go out and start buying yourself fancy new phones and cars and watches and stuff like let this be your passion. And if it's not your passion, let it help support your next passion. So if you guys want to hear more Tinker's tips, we're going to go ahead and continue this series. We're just going to touch on some important factors in the industry, things we wish we knew in the beginning. And if you guys have any suggestions for what we should cover in the next episode, we are completely open to suggestions questions the show notes should have some way to get a hold of us this is going to be our first podcast episode so we'll have to figure out how to get all of that sorted out first um, of many hopefully first of many hopefully and the reason why we're approaching this is because there's not a lot of content or podcasts out there really breaking down the novelty side of the vending industry like word for word there's a lot about snack and drink machines there's a lot about um gumball machines even just yeah. specifically but the novelty industry goes so much further than gumball machines and we want to make like an all-encompassing kind of series that talks about everything that it involves. mini claw machines are kind of a new idea right now they're mm -hmm. only just in the last like a few years yeah, so. a few years. They're pretty much a brand new idea. So now is the best time to start jumping into something that I think is going to be around for a long time. So if you guys are interested in hearing or seeing more content like this in the future, go ahead and follow Tinker the Tinker's Tips podcast. I'm going to try that again. Go ahead and follow the Tinker's Tips podcast over on Spotify and subscribe to Tinker's Toy and Hobby on YouTube to see more of what our business does behind the scenes and hear more discussion regarding the novelty vending industry. Thanks for watching and or listening, depending on how you're seeing or hearing this. And we will see or speak to you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye.